Good evening. My name is Joe Holder. I'm pastor of Little Zion Primitive Baptist Church in Bellflower, California. I'd like to welcome you to our Wednesday evening virtual service. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do, please turn to the Gospel of John chapter 11. We'll be studying, Lord willing, lessons from Lazarus tonight. While people are getting set and signing on, let's listen to a hymn. Mm -hmm. Always a delightful hymn. I always enjoy it. Hope you did as well. I Just to give you a brief update, uh, as in so many places in the country, it seems the, uh, the rate of new infections with the virus and, and to some extent the deaths as well has gone up rather steeply. I heard on the news tonight that in the last day or two, the uh, one day rate in Los Angeles County is the highest it has been since the uh, pandemic began. So we are not under, under control of this situation by any means. Uh, be safe in your habits. Be careful with, with your moving around. Keep your social distancing. Wear a mask. You've heard it so many times you're probably sick of it, but it 
our doctors tell us those are probably two of the most effective means to avoid being infected. So good reason to do so. And all of the medical indications are if more people actually practice these habits faithfully, the new infections would go down very rapidly. <clears throat> Let's uh, begin our, our time to, together with a prayer. Our Father, thank you for your blessings. You have been with us through the difficulties and uh, isolation we have experienced. Isolation is not healthy for believers, and yet you have been with us. You've given us meditation and sweet reflections on your word. You've given us fresh thoughts and, and good things to meditate on. So we thank you from our hearts for your goodness, your remembrance of us, your blessings on us. We pray your blessings upon all of those who are ill. We pray for continued recovery for our own sister, Virginia. And we pray for all of those who are suffering either from the virus or other illnesses. Be with them, give them comfort, be with their families, be with their caregivers. We pray, Father, special prayer for the caregivers who are very likely, many of them, exhausted from working long hours. Give them extra strength and alertness to be able to do what they need to do to help those who are struggling and ill. Bless our fellowship and time around the word tonight that we may learn rich truths from you and from your word and that we may believe and glorify you for the miracles of your grace. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I have gone rather rapidly through some of the recent lessons. I do not plan tonight, uh, as we go through John chapter 11, to go nearly as, as rapidly. There are some profound truths and teachings that, that we need to linger and study carefully. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll go a little slower as we go through John chapter 11 probably we'll need at least two two times to to go through it and and examine the many things that we need to to learn let's begin with a simple uh reflection of the setting of the chapter after the encounter with the Jews in John chapter 10 Jesus left Jerusalem and traveled to the Jordan Valley John 10:40 locates his, his uh, destiny beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized. Uh, it's a good, solid day's walk, and walking was the way people traveled most uh, always in those days. Bethany, the home of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, is a small village located just under two miles from the city of Jerusalem. Uh, you find that, that uh, distance identified in chapter 11, verse 18. As I mentioned, the walking time from Bethany to the Jordan Valley where Jesus uh, is located would be a good solid day. There's indication in chapter 11, verse 3, that Jesus has a close personal friendship with this family. He whom thou lovest is sick. Resurrection is probably the most powerful, amazing, and, and difficult to grasp of all of the miracles Jesus performed. In the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus raised two people that are the, the resurrection is recorded. Jairus' daughter, you'll find this reported in Matthew chapter 9, Mark chapter 5, and Luke chapter 8. He also raised the son of the widow of Nain. You'll find that recorded in Luke chapter 7. In Matthew 11 verse 5, in Jesus' reply, 
uh, sent by John's disciples while John is in prison, intended to assure and, and refresh John's conviction that he is the Messiah, Jesus includes the dead are raised up. The details and the narrative in John chapter 11 is so specific and, and so structured that, that this chapter makes a very convincing case for the facticity of Lazarus' resurrection, as miraculous as we will see it really is. The uh, chapter somewhat naturally breaks into three major sections. The first 16 verses, Lazarus is first sick and then dies. Uh, his sisters, Martha and Mary, send word by someone in the family to Jesus, uh, he whom thou lovest is sick. And Jesus uses this report to teach the disciples before they leave to come back. Verses 17 to 46, Jesus arrives, he teaches Martha and Mary, and he raises Lazarus from the dead. And then chapter, or verses 47 to 57, the Jews begin what will become their final plot to kill Jesus. We are approaching the hour of his uh, sufferings and crucifixion. So let's begin with uh, the first section. I begin reading, and, and let's just read the, first, the three, verses 3 and 4. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Jesus explains the, the intent that he has with this illness, his reaction to it, how he's going to deal with it in two ways, not one. There, is, there are two purposes. First of all, for the glory of God. Lazarus is not going to die and remain dead. That's not the way this story is going to spin out. And secondly, the Son of God will be glorified by what occurs. By Son of God, Jesus underscores his full deity, his Godhood. Remember when Jesus referred to God as his Father in John 5, verse 18, when he healed the man on the Sabbath? He said, God was, he said, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. The Jews rightly understood his words. This, quoting from that verse, he said also that God was his father making himself equal with God. The word equal in this verse is, was translated from the Greek word isos. You might, uh, if you remember your your trigonometry and algebra days, uh, mostly trigonometry, I suppose, on this uh, particular word. You might remember an isosceles triangle. That's the origin of the word isosceles. An isosceles triangle is a triangle with two exactly equal sides. So, the Jews did understand Jesus correctly. He called God his Father in a way that they understood he was saying he was in every way equal with God. J John affirms this point in John 1.1. 1, 1. The word was with God, with face-to-face -face as equals, and the word was God. So, Again, in this text, when Jesus refers to himself as the Son of God, who will be glorified by what's going to unfold with Lazarus, he again repeats the claim that he is God in human flesh. Let's go to verse 6. 
the, there's the, the the reading is lengthy, so I'm trying to select key verses and and read them to keep them fresh in our minds. Verse six, when he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. You would think, if Jesus receives message from Bethany that Lazarus is sick. Mary and Martha are not going to send word to Jesus if Lazarus has a runny nose. If they send word all the way to Jesus in the Jordan Valley, there is a serious illness going on here. Notice the interesting point. Jesus has just identified that this whole thing is going to unfold to, uh, to give glory to God and to glorify Jesus, the Son of God. Interestingly, I hope you noticed in verse 6, when he had heard therefore, therefore links Jesus' intentional two-day delay to his claim of deity and his explanation of what he intends to do with this episode of Lazarus' illness together. He is God. As God, he is able to raise the dead. And he not only is going to raise the dead, but in this case, he's going to do so after an extended delay of time. Only God could do this. There was an intentional link between the delay and the claim of glory to God and himself. There's no urgency. If you and I were to hear today that someone we dearly loved was ill and at death's door, we would make haste. We would do everything we could as rapidly as possible to go and to be with them and their family. Instead of rushing, Jesus just takes it easy, continues doing what he's doing for two full days. Verses 7 and 8. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus' word to the disciples, Let us go again, seems to have surprised them. Jesus could do whatever he wanted to do in terms of helping Lazarus as easily from the Jordan Valley as he could by Lazarus' bedside. He is not hampered or hindered by distance. He could do it easily. If the Jews were doing everything possible to stone Jesus, you'd think that's the last place he'd want to go, and yet he's ready to go. They're concerned. He seems not to be so bothered by it. Verses 9 and 10, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of, the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. If we interpret these two verses in light of Jesus' recent claim that he is the light of the world while he is in the world, he seems to be leading us to a different situation or conclusion. The time of, of light is limited. His time before his hour comes is drawing more and more narrow. The time is approaching. He knows it. He knows it when he chooses to go to Jerusalem. It's not bothering him. It's part of his design and purpose. His hour is coming soon. Verses 14 and 15. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, 
let us go unto him. There should be no misunderstanding. Lazarus is no longer sick. He's dead. When you look at all the details provided, in all likelihood, Lazarus actually died shortly after the servants left with the message to Jesus from Martha and Mary. So Jesus is a day's journey away, and yet he knows as if he were there that Lazarus is actually dead. Don't overlook. Jesus is reminding the disciples, I'm glad to the intent you may believe. We need to remember these men have left their careers. They left everything, and they have followed Jesus now for over three years. They believe in him as the the most amazing person and teacher they've ever known. They've seen him work miracles. They saw him raise the, the two children I mentioned in the beginning. But to raise Lazarus after several days delay, by the time they get there, if he's dead, he's been dead for days now. Can he really do that? Put yourself in the place of those disciples. Would you believe it so easily? This is this is a stretch of everything they they believe and, and love and know about him, and it still just pushes them to the limit. Biblical biblical faith, Jesus says, I write I do this to the intent you may believe. So they believe in him, they follow him, they grow in their belief over time, and yet even now, days or weeks, perhaps only days before his arrest and crucifixion, he still is telling them he's doing things to the intent. He's doing this with the purpose to increase their belief. Belief is often taught in modern uh, teaching as a binary. It's either you either have it or you don't have it. It's a fixed yay or nay thing. Yes, we receive faith in the new birth by the gift imparted in the new birth of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 tells us that. However, faith is not only bestowed or given in, in its essential merit and, and, and characteristics in the new birth, we may, by our conduct, by our actions in our life after that time, either nurture and cultivate that faith and make it grow, or we may stifle it. I cited a passage of, in a maybe last message, in recent message at least, from Second Peter chapter 1. We're commanded to add seven key traits or behaviors to our faith, which will make us grow and abound in that faith. If we lack those things, if we fail to add them, then we become unfruitful and barren in our faith. Our faith may grow or it may shrink. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul celebrates in his opening uh, words to the Thessalonian church, your faith groweth exceedingly. So if Jesus' intent with this whole big chapter and this episode with Lazarus is to help the disciples believe, to grow stronger and more in depth in their faith, this whole lesson, in fact, stands in perfect harmony with John's stated purpose for the Gospel of John, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And it equally puts the whole episode in harmony with Jesus' stated purpose for both the glory of God and to glorify him as the Son of God. Now let's, uh, let's look at some of his teaching as we, we unfold and unpack these verses. Verse 17, Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. 
The Jews normally would bury their dead as quickly after death as possible, quite often on the same day of the person's death. So where are the four days? Pretty simply, they can unfold in this way. Day one, Martha and Mary send the messengers to Jesus, and very likely, shortly after they leave, Lazarus dies. Verse 3. Day two and three, Jesus intentionally remains in the Jordan Valley for two days after receiving the news. Verse 6. And then in verse 17, Jesus and the disciples travel back to Bethany. Verse 17, another day's journey. So we've accounted for four full days. Lazarus has been dead and buried four full days. Is this going to hinder Jesus? Does this make the, the miracle that will glorify God impossible? Not at all. Jesus did it, waited, delayed for the four days to enhance the reality of what he would do so that the disciples would believe and be, by their belief glorify God and him. Verses 23 through 27. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Jesus saith unto her, this is Martha. She goes out to meet Jesus when she hears that he is, has, a, has arrived. She goes out to meet him, and Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again again in the resurrection at the last day, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Underscore Son of God, and remember our discussion of what that really means. Martha strongly believes. Sometimes with the, the, the meal preparation, we pick on Martha and celebrate Mary. Don't pick on Martha. She has a powerful faith that we see manifest clearly here. I want to pause here and, and spend a significant time. I, I may actually finish my time in, in this section tonight because this is so very important. In, in our generation, you will hear either rather extravagant explanations of the resurrection and the second coming, or you'll hear many pastors who literally never talk about it at all. I've talked with pastors in other churches who say there is so much confusion and people are so emotional in their belief about a certain viewpoint of the, the second coming and the resurrection that if you preach something and they don't agree, they're just so upset and heated, it's just not worth it. Well, first of all, the explanation that is most common in today's Christian teaching regarding the resurrection and the second coming is, is one of the most complex explanations that I have ever heard given about a Bible topic. And to be honest, when you talk to a number of people within the circle of that idea and belief, you'll find that there are multiple differences of understanding. They don't all agree about the complexity. Uh, far from it, in fact. I could chase all of those ideas. I could give you the history of where the idea started and the about 1828 to 1830, didn't exist in Christian theology prior to that. But instead of doing that, I want to spend my time with you in trying to just anchor our minds in what Scripture teaches about the second coming and the resurrection. 
from the conversation between Jesus and Martha that I just read, Martha says, I know he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha understands that there is only one resurrection of the physical body in the future, and that one resurrection will occur in or at the last day. Jesus doesn't correct her. He doesn't tell her, oh no, there are multiple resurrections of different classes of people on different occasions. No, he agrees with her. He in no way corrects her in any way. It's a physical bodily resurrection. We're dealing with the physical bodily resurrection of Lazarus. That's what they're discussing. And Martha's understanding it's going to occur at the last day. There's a, I want to I want to cover this this point in two, two 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 segments. First of all, there is strong biblical evidence and references to a literal physical bodily resurrection. Of all places, the the first text I want to and and I'll, I'll probably just anchor my my point there in this one lesson because it is so emphatic and so powerful in the book of Job chapter 19 very likely the first written book of the Bible even written even before Moses wrote the first five books Genesis through Deuteronomy Job is suffering troubles and trials he's he's having great difficulty and he's looking for comfort Chapter 19 of Job, verses 25 through 27. Please pay close attention to the language. I'll go through it slowly and break it down piece by piece. Job begins, For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Job writes this before the laws of redemption and the, and the law of Moses, but he still knows he has a redeemer. He needs a redeemer. I know that he lives. He lives right now. He's not going to start living uh, thousands of years later. He lives right now. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. He's living now. He's eternal. He shall still be standing and living at the end of uh, when he comes back at, at the end of time. Now, a lot of times, very well-meaning preachers rapidly read over the next verse and misread it, and then misexplain it when they begin talking about it. Let me read very slowly and deliberately. Verse 26, And though after my skin worms devour or destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Uh, I have many times heard this verse misquoted, and those skin worms devour, destroy this body. Job didn't write about skin worms. He wrote about after his skin, worms would destroy his body. He's, he's telling us in rather unpleasant graphic terms what happens when a, man, when a body dies and is buried without the benefit of embalming and, and sealed vaults and so on. Yet, despite the body's decay and going back to the earth by all of the vehicles that work on it after it's buried, yet in my flesh shall I see God. This flesh that dies, that goes back to the earth in corruption and returns to the earth, that flesh shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not another. It will be my eyes, my eyes that are seeing now, my eyes that will fade in death and go back to the earth, but in the resurrection, that 
when my Redeemer raises me from the dead, it will be my eyes that see him, and I won't be looking at another another one, and it will not be another body looking at him. It will be my body and my eyes looking at my Redeemer, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. I'm going to die, but that doesn't negate what lies ahead for me. How could you have a stronger affirmation of a literal, physical, bodily resurrection? Praise God! (laughs) There's also equally strong biblical documentation and affirmation to only one literal bodily resurrection that lies before us. I want to give you several passages to affirm this point. In the book of Acts chapter 24 verse 15, Paul is defending his faith and he says, I have hope toward God which they, the Jews, themselves also allow that there shall be many resurrections? No a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Paul affirms his belief, agreed to by the Jews. Well, that was one thing they didn't disagree with Paul about. Only one resurrection, and that resurrection would involve both the wicked and the righteous, the just and the unjust. Not multiple resurrections at all. Jesus' own words in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour, one hour, not hours, but the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Not a certain class of people that are in the graves, but all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come come forth. Jesus personally taught one resurrection that would involve all human beings who had died up until the time of the second coming. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to read a little more than usual here, verses 7 through 10. And to you who are troubled, the the Thessalonians, uh, if you study both 1 and 2 Thessalonians, were troubled over some misteaching that they had heard and believed regarding the second coming and the resurrection. Paul is going to, in Second Thessalonians, set the record straight and teach them the truth of the gospel. To you who are troubled, rest with us. If you ever hear someone preaching about the second coming of Christ and the resurrection and using that event to frighten people, tell them they have it wrong. They're misusing that truth. The real purpose of the resurrection and the doctrine of it, according to God in Scripture, is to comfort God's people and give them rest, not frighten them. Rest with us when... The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, for our testimony among you was believed in that day. The Lord's coming will be to twofold. One, to judge and meet punishment upon the wicked, and two, to be glorified in his saints by his glorifying them in resurrection, and to be admired in all his people who believe in him in that day. Some children of God don't believe in him now. They shall believe in him when they are raised from the dead and see him in glory. There's one additional point, and I'll I'll use this to punctuate the message tonight because it is so, so key to 
the reality of the, the teachings of Jesus in this lesson. I am the resurrection and the life. I confess that for years I wondered and pondered exactly what Jesus meant. He didn't say, I have the power to raise, or I intend to raise and give that endless eternal life uh, even to your dead bodies. He says, I am. It's something much more intimate and more personal. Let me suggest that in this point, Jesus is urging Martha as she thinks about her dead brother, the potential of what Jesus may be planning to do in the next few moments, to focus more on him as the real cause of both resurrection and endless life, and to think less about the nuts and bolts of resurrection. I periodically will focus or will quote from Tom Constable's uh, expository notes on the Bible. Uh, he's associated with Dallas Theological Seminary. He doesn't always come down theologically where I do, but he's one of those guys who always stirs my thinking, and, and when, when he does hit it, he hits a home run. I believe in this note, he hit a home run that I joyfully share with you. Think about, your, let, let, let's put you in, in this situation with Martha and Lazarus. You've, you've seen the doctor, you've been given the word, you have a terminal illness, and you have, at the best, weeks and perhaps only days to live. Put yourself in that state of mind, if you will, just for a moment. Here's Constable's note. When you are sick, you want a doctor and not a medical book or a formula. When you're being sued, you want a lawyer and not a law book. Likewise, when you face your last enemy, death, you want the Savior and not a doctrine written in a book. In Jesus Christ, every doctrine is made personal. Oh, my friends, we hear people spend days and weeks and whole lifetimes trying to explain the details of the second coming and the resurrection, and, and, and you get into these convoluted and complex explanations of multiple resurrections and, and all sorts of variations that just serve to dreadfully confuse people. We've found from Scripture directly that the real teaching of Scripture is one second coming and one bodily resurrection at the last day. So my friends, let me urge you to think seriously about Constable's observation. When you think about you facing that last enemy death, do you want a book that explains the resurrection? Or do you want reminders of your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ himself? We need to think more about the one who is the resurrection and the life and the details of what it will be like. We'll learn quite soon if, the, if, if our end comes quickly. I've enjoyed I always enjoy studying Jesus and the resurrection. It's the capstone of the gospel. Lord willing, we'll pick up here and continue next Sunday. I've enjoyed the time with you. God bless. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for the reminder, the rich, comforting, assuring reminder that you are the resurrection and the life. Thank you for being so kind and gracious to Martha and by your teaching her, you have taught us so much that we need to know and to remember. Lord, we pray that you would bless this truth to comfort and give peace and joyful rest to your children who may be at this time struggling with disease and age and facing this hour. Lord, be with them and give them that peaceful joy and comfort of your truth. 
let them focus not on an idea, but focus on you, the living, glorious Savior who is the resurrection and the life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining me tonight. Lord willing, we'll see you on Sunday morning. God bless.